welcome to History Hack. If you didn't know by now, we are the revolution. That means we're sharp, witty, lots of fun, but it also means that we're essentially the peasants in Les Mis huddled round a table in the corner of the bar with no money. If you enjoy the show, please do support us. We have a Patreon account by which you can donate a small monthly sum in appreciation of what you're hearing. Alternatively, we have Ko-fi in which you can just do a one-off donation as a thank you if you particularly enjoy a certain episode. Either way, we massively appreciate all of your support. Hope you enjoy the show. Hello, welcome to another episode of History Hack. I have my favourite American with me today. It's Nina. Nina, who we got on? Hello, Alina, and it's lovely to get to get to do history hack with you again. So today we have a we have a topic that we haven't covered, um, and I'm finding it absolutely fascinating because I, I will confess immediately that it's not something that I know a huge amount about. So I'm looking forward very much to moving ahead with our guest, Forrest Holden, who is an academic and a historian who specializes in the cultural history of Russia, as well as religion and magic. And today we're going to be speaking to Forrest about magic in 18th century Russia. Welcome, Forrest. Hey, how's it going? It's going great. So we're, let, let's start off right away with what can you tell us a little bit about the cultural meanings of magic in, the, in early modern Europe? Yeah, so early modern Europe is taking on a lot of the cultural meanings of magic from uh, antiquity. So um, it's interesting. I, I, I grew up like not... Um, religious and i recently read the gospels for the first time and you know this question of are things believable are unbelievable things proof of something this is a very old question that's much older than modern science right so (laughs) they're kind of things that happen that are marvelous that prove something now what does that mean in a world before science there's all kinds of phenomena that aren't really explained like you know, what's the difference between a spell and poison and a healing potion? These are all kind of phenomena that are acting without apparent cause besides, you know, you, could, you, know, you can read religion into it or something, but uh, they're, they're kind of connected, right? So the idea of magic as we kind of think of it is really connected to this ancient Roman idea of maleficium, which means to use magic to do harm. So poison, for example, could be included under this um, criterion. So... In early modern Europe, this is really the kind of idea around which witchcraft is crystallizing, but a number of other things like, you know, there's ideas that um, uh, astrology or necromancy, that these things are connected to some kind of uh, sinister practice that is beyond normal religion. And um, I guess it's worth sort of adding, this is sort of beyond early modern Europe, but for us, I think it's important to note that we, ha- we tend to think of magic in this context of the world of modern science, where it, it kind of becomes triangulated against both science and religion as kind of, <laughs> it's different from both of these things in important ways. But we kind of have to get out of that a little bit in the early modern world. The Enlightenment, though, is kind of the moment where uh, magic as we know it, the cultural meetings as we recognize it start to crystallize because there's more this idea that to believe something like that is foolish, it's superstitious, um, you know, it, it, it's, it reflects a lack of understanding of certain immutable laws of nature. And um, so we, we do kind of start to get that in the 18th century. Um, and I think, you know, one of the questions in the historiography is kind of to what extent do we see that in 18th century Russia since it's uh, famously kind of culturally lagging in some ways. That's interesting. So the idea that we, it, it's not that it begins with the Enlightenment, clearly, but the idea that during the Enlightenment that we begin to, Europe begins to privilege science and scientific method, then brings these ideas, which perhaps, if, if I understand you correctly, had been, if not mainstream culturally, at least part of the undercurrent of life. Um, so it's at this point, if, if I understand you, that, as you said, it begins to be seen as the, the other, something that is old fashioned, something that is out of practice, something that represents um, an old way of thinking, which we are now moving on and, and moving away from. Absolutely. And it's not a coincidence that this like coincides with early modern colonialism, right? So magic is also getting placed in the periphery 
things where the so-called savages uh, don't understand proper knowledge, right? That is interesting. So as you just mentioned, um, Russia, the Russian Empire during this this era is related to Europe, somewhat connected, but still very much its own place. Can you tell us a little bit more about the difference at this point in time uh, in terms of how Russia and, and the Russians might be thinking about magic? Yeah, so Russia has a very kind of different history with this because, um, well, they didn't kind of follow the same theological trends that were followed in the Catholic Church. Um, one of the big things, they didn't read Augustine for a long time. <laughs> um, so in the 17th century, um, there are a lot of witchcraft trials, not nearly as many as in Western Europe. I think it's like... like um, Oh, I don't want to make up a number, but it's 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 a significant number. It's in the thousands for sure, um, but it's not it's not nearly as prolific as in Western Europe. Um, my advisor Valerie Kilson wrote a really great book about it called Desperate Magic. There's some there's some key differences. So for one thing, in Western Europe, you know, famously, there's this accusation of a satanic pact a lot of the time. So you've you know that you've gone out to the woods and you've participated in some kind of Black Sabbath, and then you signed a pact with Satan, and that sort of sells your soul over. And this is really a big part of the fantasy of witchcraft. Uh, that's just not really there in Russian witchcraft trials. Um, they they weren't really into Satan. You get it in the 18th century, but in the 17th century, where when witchcraft trials start, you don't have it. Another really interesting thing is that uh, men are actually the majority of the accused in the Russian Empire. So. Uh, it's about 70% men, I think. Um, now, that's sort of interesting. It's not that they were targeted as men in the way that women were targeted as women in witchcraft trials. It's probably that they were, like, there were more itinerant men and sort of um, uh, men who were outsiders drifting around society. It was easier for them to travel. So that probably accounts for that. Um but yeah, I, I find it very interesting because I find it hard to explain why the witchcraft trials start in Muscovy in the 17th century, in some ways as they're winding down in Western Europe, but with a totally different to cultural framework. None of the grand explanations like Silvia Federici, although she's an amazing scholar, her sort of explanation of the causes of witchcraft don't really account for Russian witchcraft as far as I can tell. So it's sort of a puzzle to me. What's going on there? It's sort of like sometimes you find these early modern history books where you see, you know, the same things going on in like Korea as is going on in France. Uh, and it's sort of like, how, what, what's going on there? There's something about the early modern period where uh, there's like tectonic shifts going on that are really interesting and witchcraft seems to be a part of it. It's interesting. I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm intrigued by your comment that, you know, you, you don't get the pact with the devil during this period, which becomes... Um, at least over in the United States, that's the thing that that is the problem. Um, you know, it's it, it is so focused on that. So I'm intrigued by the fact that that isn't the case during this period in Russia and Muscovy. Why were at that point then? What was the reason for prosecuting or persecuting people who were believed to be witches? Um, if not, so give us give us a little bit more on, you know, so if, if there's no pact with the devil, which, again, is such a prominent aspect of it, what what is it that these, in general, men are being prosecuted for or persecuted for, whichever is appropriate? Um, yeah, it's kind of like pretty banal stuff to our eyes, mostly. Like uh, someone gave me a root and said that it would heal my cow, but it, my cow died. Uh -huh. um, things like that. So it's really tied to just like medicine practices. Okay. Uh, another common one though, that is a little more sinister are these like love spells. Um, uh -huh. So you'll sort of bewitch usually a woman that she'll have, you know, she'll die if she doesn't love you or something like that. Um, so we do have those, but um, yeah, the, the, the satanic pact element, which it's it's not in every Western European witchcraft trial. And to some extent, it is like our cultural imagination of it privileges that. But still, it's a huge part of it, right? Uh, you know, it didn't come from nowhere. So, yeah. Yeah, that's, that, is, that is interesting. 
before Nina asks her next question, I'm really interested in not just Russia. Do you know what's happening around Russia at the time as well? And like, for example, the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth, which hasn't been taken over by Russia just yet. You know, a few years <laughs> out from that one. But for example, what about other countries or the Austro-Hungarian Empire or the Habsburgs, which it is, sorry, at that time period? Do we know anything about that, what's going on around it? So I'm not an expert on that, but I can say a little bit. So there's definitely more of the satanic pact kind of stuff where there's Catholicism. Um, so generally in Poland, you're going to see witch trials that look more like Western Europe. Um, there are differences. I, I, I can't really speak to those. I'm not an expert on that. Um, but part of the reason why you, you do start to see the satanic pacts in um in, in the Russian Empire toward the end of the 17th century and then more and more in the 18th century is because Ukrainian clerics really dominated the Russian Orthodox Church. And in Kiev, they were reading a lot more Catholic kind of stuff or stuff that Catholics were reading. Um, and as, as the 18th century progressed, they were actually reading a lot of like Western European Enlightenment sort of literature too. So um, that was a Kiev was a huge conduit for Catholic theology and Catholic ideas about witchcraft into the Orthodox world. That is interesting. So there is a really interesting case. By the time we get to the latter part of the 18th century, there's a really interesting case noted in the Synod from 1770. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah. So um, this is a case that I. Uh, worked with in the archives uh, when I was there in 2019, 2020. And um, uh, so basically this is a case of uh, an accusation of demonic possession. So this is a kind of common phenomenon all over the early modern world. Um, there's kind of specificities to the Russian cases of demonic possession. This is actually a form of magic that does seem to have mostly women. So women tend to be the accusers of demonic possession or they tend to be the possessed um, and that's true in in western europe too although of course there are many, many exceptions um but so this was a case of a village where uh several people accused uh made, made accusations of demonic possession and said that they were possessed um basically this went to the ecclesiastical court as was sort of the legal custom for these kinds of things the that it kind of went through that process uh it actually went up to the synod which is the highest body of, of the ecclesiastical sort of institutions in the russian empire um and they were initially very skeptical of these claims um they kind of said you know this is crazy there's no proof um uh we're not really convinced by this but eventually they you know more and more accusations kept rolling in and you know, it takes a long time for these things to get back and forth to St. Petersburg, too. So, so things are going on as they're responding. And eventually somebody gets interrogated who produces a uh, winged worm, is what the documents call it. And uh, he claims that this winged worm was given to him by uh, the devil. Or it's a devil. It's sort of an interesting thing about the case is that the satanic pact is there, but it's not really classic Satan. It's sort of vague. It's really vague what it is. Um, but anyway, so they, they produce this worm, and that kind of convinces the Synod that, okay, maybe there's something here. We've got this worm. And the, I mean, it's sort of interesting because the Synod, it does have these guys who are basically, you know, modern, enlightened uh, European intellectuals. They, they understand <laughs> modern trends, but you know, uh, in their sort of world, this is something that can make sense to them. Um, and um, so eventually they, they decide it's real. They kind of arrest uh, the accused, so the people that the possessed were accusing. And, um, you know, it seems like that's that. Somebody in the Senate then got the got a, got kind of a wind of this. The Senate was the, basically the highest secular institution uh, within the Russian Empire. So it wasn't like elected, of course, it was appointed. But um, it was kind of an advisory body slash uh, executive body if the empress wasn't there. Um, they got a hold of this. So they decided to kind of seize jurisdiction of the case from the church, which is a kind of interesting move in itself. Um, they trucked all of these people up to St. Petersburg and interrogated all of them, decided that the worm was fake, none of this was real, 
Um, I think they, uh, they paid to kind of send everyone back. But of course, I mean, these people had all been horribly tortured throughout all this process. So like no one really escaped this <laughs> unscathed, I think. Um, but they paid for everybody to go back and wrote this really, uh, a uh, sort of scathing letter to the Synod accusing them of superstition. Uh, I can read a um, quote from it if you'd like. Um, yes, please. It's, it's, uh, so they, they accuse them of, quote, on the one hand, inveterate superstition in the form of thoughtlessness among many people, especially among the simple folk, who believe in curses through sorcery, combined with perfidy and obvious deceit on the part of those who, either out of spite or for their own profit, traffic in this superstition. On the other hand, hand we see to our extreme displeasure not only lawless acts with these supposed sorcerers but also ignorance and unforgivable carelessness on the part of the ecclesiastical courts themselves such that by credulously taking in such a palpable lie and something so impossible as truth as well as taking an empty vision as real and worthy of the court's attention the courts caused disorder without good reason from which the unjust hardships of innocent people from above was bound to result as this is a common and odious superstition among the simple folk so i just fascinated by that quote because it really shows and this whole scenario because it really shows this institutional like clash uh around this question of knowledge and how do we know what's real how do we know what kinds of things are uh entertainable you know uh it's actually playing out in institutions of power and these poor peasants their lives are in the balance and these questions really matter for them right that, that is really interesting that you have, they are so, uh, and I'm referring to the Senate here, that the Senate are so scathing in their response that they are, you know, uh, because of course, you know, um, the questions of who has power in these matters. Is it the church or is it the secular authority is an age old question that never goes away. Um, so I'm fascinated that at this point that the Senate has enough power, they feel they have enough um, authority in a case to, to essentially accuse the church, the Synod, of superstition themselves, accuse them of aiding and abetting, um, you know, beliefs that are old-fashioned, that are foolish, that are, are inappropriate. And they also comment on the effect on the common people. Now, I find that fascinating, too, because if, if I understand correctly, as you pointed out, it, it's not as if people are, there's no such thing as uh, the vote at this point. All of these authorities are appointed by the czar. They are appointed by the imperial powers. And yet they are explicitly calling out the synod for um, injuring and uh, aiding and abetting superstition amongst the common people. That is a fascinating passage. Um, I'm interested in then what is the reaction? What's the response after the Senate hands this down and says, really, you know, get it together and stop aiding and abetting superstition and nonsense out here in the provinces. Take better care of the common people. Is there, are there other cases? Does this put the, you know, bang the lid down on um prosecution or persecution of witches or is this a one-off and the idea of witchcraft continues to bergen and there are more trials and 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 um actions against witchcraft uh primarily by the church tell us tell us more about what happens in the aftermath of this ruling yeah so it's sort of a one-off um the the synod did what they were told and they sent copies of this reprimand out to all of the consistories so you know that must have had some effect and you know but um but when, there are more trials after this of similar kinds of things and there's also though i mean these trials are often connected to like heresy trials or um uh what's the word blasphemy trials you know so these are seen as as totally legitimate by everyone kind of so there's a gray area it's harder to decide what's what there than we'd think in some ways um and um then but but in the long run i think it's some time in the 1780s there was a reform of the legal system so um catherine established what are called the courts of conscience which i think uh, i think that's a term from 
British history um, that they sort of have used to translate it. Um, but essentially all accusations of witchcraft are supposed to go through these secular courts now. And it's very clear in the law established for this court that witchcraft is not real <laughs> and that um, the crime is to make the accusation because it shows superstition and or charlatanry of some kind. So in a way, it's, 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 it's difficult because from, from a certain perspective in the cultural context of these cases, like this case of demonic possession, you see these women who are generally not in very, not in positions of power, right? A lot of times they're kind of in pretty subservient positions. They have a lot of potential for abuse. They're, they have a cultural script to make these accusations against people with power over them that people kind of can understand and that can change their circumstances. But once these sort of, you know, these laws change in a way that we might think of as progressive, uh, they no longer have that available to them. Actually, they're criminalized for making these accusations. So it's a sort of weird irony <laughs> of power and witchcraft laws that uh, in a way there was a function to that, I think, to, to, the witch, to, the, to the witchcraft accusations. But You know, I'm actually interested in, because I, I know Nina doesn't want to say the, say the name. She's like, no, 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 your pronunciation will be so much better. So we're going to talk about a dictionary. We're going to talk about uh, Mikali Hulkov's di- uh, the Mikali Hulkov dictionary. First of all, what what are we looking at? What is it? And please explain to our listeners because they're probably just as confused as the rest of us. Yeah. So this is a really exciting document. It's about like 150, 200 pages. It's um, a dictionary of Russian superstition. So in the 18th century, a dictionary was more like what we would call an encyclopedia. Uh, it's just sort of an alphabetized series of articles on a topic. Um, so this was very much inspired by, you know, Diderot's uh, encyclopedia, which I think the subtitle of Diderot's encyclopedia was a dictionary of reason, sciences and arts or something like that. So um, it, it, we think we can think of it as an encyclopedia kind of. So his goal was to collect uh, information about all of the superstitious beliefs of, of everybody in the Russian Empire, basically. Um so a lot of it uh, is dedicated to thinking about people in Kamchatka uh, and in Siberia. Um, it, it was the project was funded by these brothers, the Gulikov brothers, who had a financial interest in exploring Siberia and Alaska. So I think that kind of accounts for um, his interest in Kamchatka and um, those peoples. But there's a lot of stuff about like these different Finnic peoples all over European Russia. Um, and then there's some stuff about, um, well, you know, old believers, uh, and there's, there's some stuff about contemporaries like sprinkled in, um, but it's mostly kind of, it mostly focuses on, I would say the colonized peoples of the Russian empire. Um, because like, like I kind of mentioned earlier, this idea that magic is irrational, magic has some kind of moral, uh, deviation tied to it. And so it's starts being placed on these colonial peripheries uh, uh, in a lot of ways. So I think the dictionary reflects that. It's about like um, each article is, you know, ranging from like half a page to 12 or 15 pages. Uh, and there's maybe you know, dozens of articles. Do you have any examples that you can give our listeners of what, it, what actually contained within it? So something more specific? Sure. Um, well, so he has like article, he has one article called Fortune Tellers, Witches, Black Magicians, Sorcerers, Magi, and Magicians. And it's a long article. And he sort of goes through different ideas about these, you know, the kind of witch-like figures, um, mostly attributing these beliefs to non-Russian peoples. But it's kind of like, he, he sometimes conflates historical Russian beliefs with contemporary non-Russian beliefs in the context of the empire. There's sort of a, a sense that what was the Russian past is the so-called pagan present. So um, there's a sort of weird slipperiness uh, sometimes. Question. With this, is a possibility that he also uses this encyclopedia dictionary to demean other nationalities, cultures, and whatnot, for example, to show the superiority of Russia over, let's say, I don't know, the Kazakhs or Uzbekistanis or even Poles and Ukrainians and Lithuanians and Latvians. Totally. I mean, it's, 
I mean, I think it's just it's taking a position of epistemological superiority from the get go that he, as the author, can kind of look at these beliefs, determine that they're absurd, foolish, or evil, and um, you know, compile them into a thing that uh, that puts them all together into this category of superstition. And I think you know, it's it's on the one hand, it's a tool for learning for someone like the Galikovs who are colonizing Siberia. On the other hand, these are probably it's probably a kind of object of amusement. You know, you can read through these articles and laugh at the absurdity of these beliefs. Um, he does have some kind of. I mean, it is sort of funny sometimes. Not the not when he's making fun of these colonized peoples, but he does have a sharp wit sometimes. So there is one point where he um, there's an article that says uh, um, a superstitious person uh, is the title of the article. And it has no body. It just says, see Christian. <laughs> um, <laughs> so he's okay. really a little, you know, Diderot, irony kind of thing. It, it is a little shocking in the context of the Russian Empire where, you know, <laughs> the church is very powerful still. Um, but so it does have a kind of winking sense of humor to it sometimes. And I think that definitely, you know, uh, the audience he imagines reads these descriptions of of so-called savage or uncivilized be uh, beliefs and practices with an eye of kind of like amusement and, and derision, as you said. I think it's fascinating that it becomes an object. Uh, there are elements of amusement, elements of delectation, elements of being in the know in terms of how he imagines the audience reception. And yet at the same time, it also appears clear that it could be seen as part of an imperial project. Um, how do reactions and ideas about magic and civilization actually, how did they, how did they become a reflection of, or, or not, um, imperial ideology during this period? How would you fit these beliefs or ideas about these beliefs into a larger imperialist ideological project? Yeah, I mean, I think it's a great question. It's really, it's really important to the structure of, of, uh, of modern knowledge, I think, to understand that it, it is about sorting what beliefs and practices are right and which ones are wrong in certain ways. So um, there is still this connection to thinking about um, magic as something that's primitive or people that who, who are uneducated or uncivilized or so on would believe in, right? Um, there's like a lot of these tropes are still kind of with us. And yeah, a lot of them come down to ideas of Christianity as the sort of source of civilization. Belief that sort of like practice of Christianity cultivates one morally and intellectually to understand the world properly. Um, so I think that, that that is all very much tied to the early modern constellation of empires, which are, you know, I think we need to think of them more as a network of empires that are interdependent on each other than as these individual imperial histories. And I think definitely how, what kinds of intellectual tools were developed to kind of draw these lines between the metropole and the periphery, um, they're really important because they're not just about defining the other, they're also about the habitus of the people in the metropole, right? Who conceive themselves in relation to the other. And it becomes a very important part of their worldview. So it's, um, I think it's a really key part of imperial ideology. I think, and I, I mean, that's what fascinates me about history of magic and superstition is that it really gets to this question of uh, who do we believe is has the right to speak rationally, whose voice has authority, you know, who has the right to make someone listen to them. <laughs> well, this is actually a really good point because that's where we're going to move on to next, which are the Russian Freemasons. I mean, you can trace them back to, what is it, the 15th century in Europe and in Russia, it was the 18th century. Did I get that right? Yeah, so I think they, I think they pretty much appear in Russia around Peter the Great's time. Yeah. Uh, what, what do they have to do with this whole narrative? Where do they come into all of this? Yes, yeah, so Freemasonry was really popular in 18th century Russia, especially in the second half of the 18th century. Uh, most kind of prominent intellectual men in St. Petersburg and Moscow were either Freemasons or connected to Freemasons. 
And um, they're really fascinating because they were really into these mystical strands of Freemasonry, like Rosicrucianism. So they were interested in alchemy. They were interested in, um, you know, these kinds of, they, they believed that there were specific practices related to Freemasonry that could kind of reconcile science and religion <laughs> and um, essentially transcend this divide. Um, so they're very, you know, they're very weird. I think there's a tendency in the historiography to think of, to explain this away as, well, Russia's sort of culturally backwards. They just don't quite get it yet. So they're kind of, they have these vestigial, uh, you know, uh, magical beliefs. I don't really buy that. To me, it seems like they perfectly well understand <laughs> uh, the place of magic in the enlightened world. And they definitely see themselves as enlightened. Uh, and they, you know, it's tamed for them in some ways. They see what they're doing as different from whatever a, you know, Kazakh shaman would be doing. I find it fascinating that this organization, um, which becomes known even, well, even in the 20th century as being a way for um, powerful men to meet each other and to exercise, you know, work connections, exercise their power. So how much of this reconciliation, how much of the um, magical practices, if, if that's even the appropriate term, of the Russian Freemasons are important compared to it as a powerful organization during a period, again, of the growing Imperial project and who's in, who's out, where is my place? Can you, can you comment on that? Yeah, I think uh, the specific social context of the Russian empire made it sort of institutionally irrelevant in some ways because all these guys were noblemen anyway. So, yeah. <laughs> I mean, not all of them, but most of them. And if they weren't noblemen, they were well connected. So there were other institutions of power around it. I mean, so it did it did become an issue in that Paul, the heir to Catherine, was involved with Freemasons. And there were accusations of some kind of plot at some point. So Catherine really cracked down on Freemasons in the 1790s. But this was kind of, there was a Europe-wide crackdown on Freemasons after the French Revolution. People got really paranoid about Freemasons. So it was kind of like a part of that. But yeah, it sort of, it seemed like it didn't really change the cultural landscape all that much in terms of access to power when the Freemasons kind of uh, faded away in Russia. Uh, they came back in the 19th century, of course, but they, they kind of went away for 25 or 30 years there. So um, I think because, you know, in the U.S., it, the Freemasons were a very important organization for networking and for developing networks of power and political machines. Um, I live near Detroit, so if you, you can't walk down a street in Detroit without finding some remnant of Freemasonry somewhere. Um, but in, I think in the Russian Empire, because people were already so tied to this tight institution of power, it, it, was, it was not quite relevant in that way. Interesting. And as, as just a quick side point, I discovered that one of my great grandmother, great grandfathers was a Freemason. Yeah. And in his case, it was very much trying to connect to a network of power. So it's interesting that the, the power aspect of it is almost unnecessary or it's maybe part of it maybe it's a consolidation maybe it's it's there are more social issues but that that doesn't appear to be the reason that it becomes um in, becomes important the the russian the former russian empire it's it's lengthy period as the ussr and now it's it's very um interesting and complex uh, situation now. Can, so this is a big question, but can you characterize or give us a little bit of insight into what the meaning of magic might be in contemporary Russia? Any, any comments or thoughts that you could, you could give us about the situation now? And is there a role for magic um, or mm. not currently? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I think um, having spent some time in Russia, of course, not in the last couple of years, because I can't go back now. But 
Um, there's a lot of belief in magic. Um, uh, I, I mean, but to me, it feels very similar to the U.S. There's a lot of conspiracy theories. There's a lot of kind of quasi-mysticism, pseudo-scientific quasi-mysticism. Um, and there are a lot of kind of eccentric spiritual beliefs that people really um, dig into. But something that's something that's interesting about magic everywhere is like because it was so tied to the colonial periphery, it also sometimes becomes a kind of symbol of some kind of epistemic resistance or um, loyalty to one's kind of uh, native culture, indigenous culture. Mm. So like you will see in like the Latinx community, a lot of people will identify as witches in a way that's sort of meant to tie themselves to indigenous um you know, um, pre pre Spanish culture. Um, so there's a kind of interesting way in which this is played out, like in a postmodern way, where I think people um, see magic as a way to reject the epistemological norms of the world. I think it gets kind of it gets dangerous when it gets mixed in with things like QAnon uh, and these really large scale conspiracy theories, and they really do because people have a sense that they're uh, things things aren't being explained to them in a way that makes sense, or there's something not right <laughs> about the way things are, and it becomes a kind of a way to embrace like a counter systemic identity in some ways. Um, so I think it can be you know really beautiful. It can be tied to really interesting and um, powerful practices. It can also be kind of like a gateway into these um really strange and eccentric conspiracy theories that have large scale sociological impacts so i mean I, 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 in, in russia now like since the since the news has basically kind of collapsed uh, or any any sort of like semblance of liberal news media telegram is sort of where people get all their information and there's all kinds of just crazy conspiracy theories and you know magical beliefs and supernatural things going everywhere it's it, there's a lot of just uh, misinformation, but I was homeschooled by hippies in the U S. So I know that there are a lot of those people <laughs> in the U S too. So I don't know. Too, I, I think that um, in some ways, Russia is like ahead of the curve with that stuff. There's, I, th I think like the Russian conspiracy internet is sort of somewhat predictive of our conspiracy internet <laughs> in some ways, but I think, yeah, I, I guess I would see it as more tied to a global culture of science and its relationship to magic that I would have specifically rooted in like that history of Russia. But I did want to say, I, I thought of something to your previous question about power and Freemasons, which is I mean, very stupid to forget. Freemasons are of course uh, men. So this was a very important institution, I think in a context with an empress, uh, in, uh, it was an important way for men to gather power in a, in a, in a homosocial environment. And I do think that uh, the sort of Russian noble masculinity that emerged in the 19th century was tied to that. So in that sense, it is a very important uh, sort of uh, incubator of, of certain institutions of power. Yeah. So I just wanted to say that. Well, I just think it's been great. We haven't done a topic on Russia for a really long time, uh, especially something to do with witchcraft and magic. We've not touched that in this specific context in a really really long time it's been a breath of fresh air thank you so much when is your book going to come out on this subject uh to be determined <laughs> i have to finish my dissertation first so. Perfect. we're very much looking forward to it and when it comes out come back on and we'll do something else awesome thank you i had a great time thank you so thank much you very for joining much. us this was fantastic. Thanks so much for being a guest on History Hack today, Forrest. I've really enjoyed it, and I've learned a tremendous amount. Well, thanks so, thanks so much for having me. Our incredible guests give us 45 minutes of their time to join us and talk about their work or their new book. This is just a small taster. As a result, we have launched our very own bookshop on bookshop.org, where you can find our guests' latest books, you can support them, and you can support us on History Hack. 10% of every sale via our bookshop supports the podcast and allows us to keep going and bring you more top-of-the-line guests. You can find our bookshop at bookshop.org forward slash shop forward slash history hack or search for us in the shop section. 
Thank you so much for your continued support. We really appreciate our listeners and supporters. So make sure you get down to the bookshop and grab yourselves a new book.